So let's get started. <clears throat> okay, and welcome back. Today, I wanna talk about sensing and what is a camera. Last time we learned, you know, what a pinhole camera is. Fundamentally, a camera is camera obscura, Latin for dark room. You know, a camera is a, it's a box like this that grabs pictures and forms an image. But what is it that a camera measures? I, I sort of asked that fundamental question. A lot of uh, what I saw in the literature is people did image processing, having some numbers come in and do something with the images. And we look spatially at what those uh, numbers represent in terms of a, of a picture or a shape or an object, but nobody was looking at what an individual pixel means in terms of as a, as a number, as a quantity. So I came up with this concept of photoquantographic uh, sensing, the photo quantity. And uh, I want to just take an example. If I, if, if I take a light bulb, I guess everyone knows what a light bulb is. A light bulb is a is look, looks like this, and it's the wellspring of ideas. Light bulbs are synonymous with ideas. Uh, we always talk about that metaphor, like a light bulb. Whenever you see a cartoon or an image, you'll often see a picture of something. I was just looking in the news recently. You know, you see these news. We have what we call a light bulb moment. People talk about a light bulb moment. A light bulb is a symbol of ideas, a symbol. People often talk about a light bulb moment. Light bulb is a symbol of ideas, creation, creativity, and how we think of things. I even made this fun little thing. It's a little light bulb that you can wear on your head. It has a brainwave sensor that lights up whenever you think of an idea. It uses a neural network and training algorithm to light up when you have an idea. And we have, you know, the frosh helmet there with a light bulb on top. And we had this idea of, a, of an engineering hard hat that has a bulb on it that lights up whenever it senses your brain. We did it, we trained a neural network to learn when you think of new ideas and turn on the light bulb. So kind of match that proverbial light bulb. So the idea that, that ideas spring from light bulbs. And we'll talk more about that uh, later on. But I want to just say, okay, here's, here's a light bulb. And if I turn on that bulb, there's some light. And what we notice is that um, the light, you know, it lights up. If I want to see that light bulb clearly, I can adjust the exposure of my camera. Maybe the image is overexposed now. Let's say I'll, I'll adjust the shutter speed for argument's sake. So let's say I go down to, you know, one eight thousandth of a second. So at one eight thousandth of a second, you can kind of see the filament. It's not totally crystal clear. I'll probably have to also drop the aperture down to f22. Now you can see the filament in that light bulb. You can kind of see what the light bulb is shaped like at uh, at this exposure. I'll just turn off my level indicator because. So now you can see that bulb at, at this exposure. You can. You can see the filament in that light bulb. It's a piece of tungsten filament that's heated up. And you can kind of see its shape almost anyway. I probably have to drop the ISO a bit too to really see it clearly. Let's say I go down to 100 ISO. Now I think you can see that filament. It's a little coil. You can kind of make out the coil uh, of the filament. You can see how the filament is structured or made but you can't see too much else other than that filament. That's ISO 100 F22 at 1 8,000th of a second. If I want to see a little bit of anything else in the room, I have to, uh, you know, allow more light into the camera, either open up the iris. This is opening the aperture so that it's bigger. I can turn up the ISO, which is the sensitivity. It's kind of analogous to gain. And now I can see a little bit of what's in the room, but I can no longer see the filament clearly. I can see a little bit of what's in the surrounding room. And if I lengthen the shutter speed from one eight thousandth to say one four thousandth, you can see a little bit more. One two thousandth, each, each three clicks is a doubling of the amount of light. So the light is in third f-stop. So 
and another three clicks. That's about twice as much light and another three clicks, another doubling and another doubling and so on. Maybe one more doubling. By now you can you can sort of see the rest of the room, but it's hard to see the light bulb clearly. It's hard to understand what's inside that filament. If I, even if I hold the filament up close to the camera, it's hard to see it. It's hard to see what's in there at this exposure until you back it off a little bit. And then you might say, well, what's the optimum exposure? You know, I can I can have a camera that has an automatic exposure and it automatically adjusts itself to the optimum exposure. So it's going to pick some shutter speed and pick some aperture and pick some ISO or gain setting automatically. And so invariably it'll choose something that tries to make the best. So here you can see, you still can't see the dark side of my face, but uh, now uh, as we increase the gain, in order to see the dark side of my face, the light side of my face is overexposed. So one side of my face is bright and the other side is dark, let's say. If the sun's shining on one side of your face, I can adjust the exposure so that this side of the face is clear. Now I can see the, the light, I can see my right ear. But if I go any brighter than that, I can't see much detail in my right ear. My right ear is just a white blob, but I still can't see the left side of my face, I certainly can't see my left ear. To see my left ear, I have to keep turning up the gain. Now I can kind of see my left ear, but the right side of my face is all completely white. So this is, you know, a high contrast scene. And one thing that photographers do to try to balance the contrast is to turn on some additional lights. So I can try and turn on other lights here. I got a video light up there and another video light over here. And I can turn these lights up to try to reduce the contrast there. See, so you can see the effect. But you need a lot of external lighting. And sometimes you just have a natural scene and you want to capture that natural scene as it is without having to add extra lights to the scene, without having to add. I could put another light bulb over here, but then it wouldn't be that scene. It wouldn't be so natural sunlight or whatever it is. You got a ray of sunlight, a shaft of sunlight streaming into the room through an open window. And it looks beautiful. If you turn on the interior lights so that you can see what's going on, it kind of destroys that beauty. Wouldn't it be nice if we could capture the world as it is rather than the world that we have to make it in order to be captured? I remember when I used to, sometimes I'd be interviewed on TV. They'd bring me in for a TV interview. And the first thing they would do is slap tons of makeup all over my face because uh, they said it made it easier to see the exposure levels. And then I was wearing a computer with antennae sticking out. I had an antenna sticking out of my backpack. And they said, oh, can we spray that with dulling spray? You know, because it's oversaturating the camera. So this is what they used to do. You know, I was interviewed on the on this on a streetcar. And as soon as I got on the streetcar, they put a big piece of plastic over the, you know, the, the handrail. It was a shiny uh, chrome plated rail and it was overexposing the camera. So they put a piece of plastic over it to dull in it a little bit to make it not blow out the camera. Because if they turned down the exposure of the camera, then it would be quite dark and they didn't want to do that. So they had to alter the scene. They got to slop tons of makeup on people and put uh, plastic uh, tape on everything to dull in it to make it more diffuse and less specular and spray everything with dulling spray. Every shiny object in the scene, they'd go around and spray it with a special dulling spray that would temporarily make it less shiny so that the camera was able to see it. And then they'd put up great big fill lights and reflectors to sort of soften the light contrast. And by the time they were done, they tamed the scene down to the point where it could be captured on photographic materials. The human eye, of course, sees a dynamic range much greater than what film used to see. But I was fascinated by, wouldn't it be nice, I asked, if we didn't have to do all this, if we could just build a camera that would measure how much light comes from each point in space. And I envisioned a camera as an array of light meters or an array of sensors, a sensing device rather than just a photographic picture taking device. I said, well, what if a camera was intelligent? What if a camera could measure and sense and understand the world around it mathematically rather than just take pictures? And so this is where the idea of intelligent image processing was born in my childhood. I experimented a lot with welding helmets. I've got some welding helmets up there on the shelf. My 
grandfather taught me to weld when I was four years old. He introduced me to the idea of welding and I thought, wow, that was really fun. And it's kind of exhilarating and a little bit terrifying at sorts because you know, you're know you looking at the world through this really dark piece of glass and all you can see is this tiny little pinprick of light. You, know, you just see this tiny, in order to sort of safely view the world, you have to look at everything through a dark glass. So you've got this little point of light that you're moving around here and everything else is completely black. And I wondered, uh, what when, isn't there a better way? Couldn't I build something using technology that would allow me to see a dynamic range of more than 100 million to one? And so what I envisioned is a camera system that would take at different exposures and combine multiple different exposures together. And so this is was kind of a childhood vision of mine. And I, I brought this and many other ideas to MIT when I was accepted there. In the early 1990s, I invented something called HDR, High Dynamic Range Imaging, uh, continuing this. This was kind of an ongoing invention from my childhood, but I really perfected it at MIT uh, and, and uh, developed this system that grabbed multiple different exposures. So what I did is it would rapidly take uh, so the, the the idea I had was that you know you would take a video in which you know there would be one frame at one eight thousandth of a second, and then after that take another one at a four thousandth, and then take another one at a two thousandth, and another one at one one thousandth, and another one at at one two fiftieth of a second, and so on, and rapidly in rapid succession take these exposures, and then use those exposures to mathematically determine how much light was actually arriving at each pixel location in the scene. And then with that information, take that data and, and combine all that information together and consolidate that information so that you have this aggregate uh, image that is uh, what, I, what I referred to as a, as a photo, photo quantograph. So I said, uh, what a camera measures is this photoquantographic unit. It is not radiance, it is not irradiance, and it is not luminance, and is, it is not illuminance. That is to say, it's not radiance because it the camera is not an antenna, it's not a radiometer. It, it favors some wavelengths more than others. Um, and so it's not it's not really measuring radiance. It's not really measuring luminance either. It doesn't measure the same way the human eye does. It's not measuring with the spectral sensitivity of the human eye, but it has its own unique spectral sensitivity. And every sensor you know, has its own kind of unique spectral sensitivity. So it measures what I call the photoquantographic unit or the photo quantity. Some quantity Q is sensed, uh, and that, that is fundamentally what a camera measures. And so I said, well, let's build this photoquantograph. Let's build this understanding of reality using intelligent image processing that allows us to see and understand the world around us and, and, and make, make sense of that world using a kind of mathematical formulation, which I referred to as comparometric equations is, is, is one way of looking at it. It's we're comparing the scene as it's reported by multiple different uh, sources. So you can say that each of these cameras that's taking at a different exposure. Imagine if we thought of them as separate cameras that are each set to a separate gain and all saw the world from the same vantage point. What we have is pictures of the same subject matter where the pictures differ only in their exposure and in no other way. It's just the only difference between one picture and another picture is the exposure. In all other regards, they're reporting the same thing. So. We have these multiple reportings of reality, and we ask the mathematical question, the fundamental question, what is the true reality? What's a true and accurate depiction of what is being sensed? And we call that the photo photoquantograph. And so a lot of my invent other inventions, a lot of my other inventions, like the wearable face recognizer, for example, that I invented in the early 1990s, the eyeglasses that serve for people with prosopagnosia, prosopagnosia is face blindness. Many people suffer from this. So the eyeglasses help by annotating the name and face of the person you're seeing with a virtual overlay using artificial intelligence, machine learning, and neural networks. I 
my mentor when I was at MIT was Marvin Minsky. He's the father of AI and machine learning. Another person who mentored me greatly was Bertolt Horn. He invented the field of, of robot vision, computer vision. So together, um, <clears throat> Minsky and Horn were, were, were great influencers of my thinking. And so we were looking at AI and machine learning and machine intelligence and this notion of human machine intelligence, human humanistic AI, as we call it, or humanistic intelligence, uh, or wearable AI, if you want to call it. And so this concept was uh, the, the general idea around this concept was to build a, a model of the world and, and understand it. And what I said is, if we can use the camera as a scientific measurement instrument, then all of a sudden, we can try to ask fundamental questions about what's in the world around us. So that was the first step, is to ask scientifically what a camera measures. And so a camera measures this thing called the quantograph, photoquantograph. The quantograph is Q, you know what we call it. So I say that a camera measures some function of Q. So Q is a quantity that varies over X and Y, let's say. More generally, I use the concept of a light space, which is the tensor outer product of a light field with a time reversed light field. But we'll get into that more uh, further on in, in, in chapter five. But for now, I just want to think very simply. Let's say that a camera measures some quantity Q and that that quantity Q varies as a function of X and Y. So a camera measures Q of X, Y. Uh, and what it reports to us is some function of that quantity of x, y, f of q of x, y. So what we have is this kind of composite function. So we're going to understand a little bit about functional analysis, functional equations, and uh, comparametric equations are a special kind of mathematical equation which form the fundamental basis of HDR sensing. And HDR sensing really more generally is multi-frame sensing. And so what we're doing is using multiple frames of the same subject matter. So back in the early 90s, I came up with something called CEMENT, C-E-M-E-N-T, which is an acronym. It stands for Computer Enhanced Multiple Exposure Numerical Technique. And the idea of CEMENT was to cement together our understanding of the world by looking at multiple frames of the same subject matter. So CEMENT is a kind of AI machine learning uh, framework that tries to understand the world and cement together multiple interpretations of that world. And the simplest example, of course, uh, or a very simple example at least, is to take multiply differently exposed, multiple differently exposed images and combine them together in order to determine the true amount of light that's arriving at each point in space. And thus, in some sense, turn the camera into an array of light meters. Imagine, if you will, if I had a camera, and I did this, you know, experiment. I've got a camera here, uh, this camera over here. You can see the leather bellows here. You can see the lens at the front and at the back. There's an image plane where the film normally goes. What I did as a fun little experiment is I put a whole bunch of light meters on that back plane. So I put an array of light meters on the back plane to measure the amount of light, and that of course, measured the amount of light coming through from each direction in space. And then I said, okay, well, what if we put a, on a light meter on an XY plotter? Like uh, one of these things back here, that's an XY plotter I've got back on my shelf there that was made in 1968, something. A lot of these tools from my childhood make it easy to understand the world and how the world works because these are very simple devices. So if I have an, a light meter on an XY plotter and I move it back and forth be, on the image plane, I can take a subject matter that's stationary where the subject matter is not changing and image that subject matter photoquantographically. And so this is, this is, is, is what I end up with uh, when, I, when I create that. And th this is kind of what we're getting at with HDR or more generally with quantigraphic sensing. So, and and in fact, more generally, uh, I, I used to record audio when I, well, I've got a microphone in front of my mouth now. And when I was growing up, what I used to do is I would take my microphone and I would plug it into a stereo tape recorder, but it's a mono microphone. So instead of plugging the same thing into both channels exactly, 
I would have the microphone plugged into both channels and I'd turn the gain on one channel up really high and I'd have the other channel really low. So I'd have this this thing where where like the you know the left channel would be really underexposed like this and the right channel would be massively overexposed akin to that. And by combining these differently exposed channels, I would try to determine the true sound source. So HDR works with a variety of kinds of signals. With radar, I made HDR radar system, HDR sonar, HDR audio, HDR video. And so it was a general philosophy of measurement to combine multiple differently gained measurements of the same thing in order to determine a better estimate of the true and accurate uh, quantity being sensed. So now what I'll do is I'll switch over to my document camera. I'm going to go to OBS. I'm using OBS here and I'm going to switch over to um, to the document camera. Now, one thing when I switch to the document camera, you lose my dashboard. I've got uh, my dashboard here is is showing like my my heart rate, uh, blood pressure, systolic, diastolic blood pressure, the rushiness of my brain, my F nearest data, and everything is on the dashboard. And I'm going to switch over to the ceiling camera with the A7 inlay. So now I've got the ceiling camera with my other camera inlay, and I'm going to swing this around here like that. Now you can see over here I've got I've got a I've got a table which is a glass table that you can see uh, light shines right through it. It's a it's an opal glass, so it's nice to backlight it and so on. And I'll turn this off now. You can see that light has quite a bit of afterglow as well when the as it goes off. See when it it comes on, the filament glows, and when it goes off, you can see. If you bring it a little closer, you can even see that afterglow on the filament as it cools down. So I've got various measurement instruments here. These are various light meters. These are measurement instruments, photographic exposure meters like this. This uh, is a light meter and it measures how much light is present. And you can see from a photographic exposure point of view, you can see how how much the quantity of light present in the scene. So it adjusts, it tells you how to adjust the camera exposure. And there's various, various light meters like that. These are, are measurement devices, which this one here, it has a, a solar cell in there that generates electricity that runs a meter. This meter is self-powered. It powers, it, it gets its power source from the light that it's measuring solar powered light meter and you know, there's a variety of other this is a general electric light meter similar light values i don't know if you guys can see that So these, these devices measure light, and then there's other more scientific measurement instruments like, like this kind of thing from Thor Labs that measures light. It has different sensitivity settings, and it takes a photo detector that plugs in. And these, these photo detectors look like this. Light shines into the photo detector, and it produces a voltage that can be measured. And... These are some more photo detectors, different kinds of photo detectors, photodiodes, and so on. Some of these light meters use a photoresistor. So a photoresistor looks like that. And we have the photocell experiment. If you search, I'll make a link to it, photocell experiment. But this is a photo detector that, that measures light by, and it changes resistance when the when the when the light changes here's another example of one of these mounted to a little 
circuit board. And so these things allow us to measure how much light is present in the scene. And uh, this is another, uh, another device is this, this uh, dense atometer that measures how much light is present passing through a piece of film. So this is from, Char a, lot, a lot of these instruments, I, I got some of them from Charles Wyckoff, a good friend of mine, he gave me uh, all, a lot of his instrumentation. Uh, we were collaborating together and he gave me a lot of these instruments and, and uh, I was wondering why he gave me all of his scientific measuring instruments. And then uh, unfortunately later I, I read that he passed on. Uh, so he's no longer with us, unfortunately. I, I archived a lot of his papers and, and notes and work to try to remember some of the great work that he did. Charles Wyckoff invented a kind of film that has different layers of sensitivity and allows to record uh, scenes that have a lot of dynamic range in them. So he did a lot of photographs of nuclear explosions and atomic bombs and things like that that have a lot of, of a contrast range. So uh, there's there's a, a lot of ways you can measure light and measure the film, like this, this instrument here measures film uh, that has measured light. So you can quantify the density of the film. So what we can do to make measurement instruments, so this, this is a, a typical multimeter. And this multimeter, there it is, I think it, it, it sort of comes into focus trying to figure out how to get this camera to focus. There it is. And so this is a multimeter and, and it, it allows us to, to measure different quantities. This is a digital multimeter and you may want to, to get something like this. Actually, what I'll do is I'll turn off the little inlay so we can see more. So we'll just have the ceiling camera. There's the ceiling camera by itself uh, without the inset. I want to get this table better framed. I think that's a little bit better. So now we can see so now you can see there's a multimeter here, for example, and that allows us, so that fluke multimeter allows us to measure uh, resistance, for example. And if I put that, so you can kind of make your own light meter, if you will, by just taking a fluke multimeter like this. And it has leads, it has test leads hanging out of it. And these test leads, you can touch the test leads to different electrical components to measure the electrical components. So those test leads allow you to measure different electrical phenomena. These test leads allow you to measure different electrical phenomenology by sticking the leads onto something and measuring it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these test leads off. And then I'm going to replace, I've got, instead of those test leads, I've got this thing, which is, I call it a banana gator. It's got banana plugs on one end and alligator plugs on the other end. I'm gonna plug that in here. Or you can just use alligator clips on the test leads. So I'm gonna plug that into the multimeter like this. And then that gives us alligator clips on there. And then I can take, I can take this photoresistor and clip it onto here like this. The polarity doesn't matter. Same polarity either way. And now I've got a resistance measurement. And you can see that now it's about 2.3 mega ohms. 2 million 530 ohms or whatever it is. It's kind of fluctuating because it's moving around. When I point it over at the window, if I point it, over here, it's at some value of resistance. You'll say three mega ohms. 
And if I point it in here, let's say I point it at my black shirt, it's gone to approximately infinity, six mega ohms. But if I press it right against my black shirt, it'll go to approximately infinity. And as I turn it around, if I turn that light on over there, if I grab a light bulb, and bring it close to that bulb. I don't know if you can see it, it's hard to see. That's, we need HDR, we need an HDR camera to actually see the measurement instrument. Can, can anybody read that? So it says about 2,000, 2.5 thousand, two and a half thousand ohms instead of two and a half million ohms. It was about two and a half million ohms when the light was off and it's about two and a half thousand ohms when the light is on. So you can see it's much, as I bring it closer to the lamp, of course the resist, the, the number decreases, it, it gets lower, the resistance is less. So that's less resistance closer to the lamp. As I move it further away, the resistance goes up. It's an auto-ranging meter, so it'll keep auto-ranging. But as I move it further and further away, the resistance goes up. So we can see, we can use this as a way of measuring the amount of light present in a scene. But there's some function of resistance. So if I take a different, uh, a different photoresistor, Put this on. This will give us a. It'll have a different profile. Have it. Not only will it have a different response overall, but it'll you know give us different numbers. You see that one. The numbers it's giving us. Like this is nine ohms, nine point one ohms. It's much lower resistance. And as I move it away, fourteen ohms, fifteen ohms, and I move it further, twenty ohms, twenty five ohms. And I've got it further away, you can see, I don't know if you can see that. Let's go left to right so it's a little bit easier to see. I'll put it right here at one end of the table, right there. And then I'll put the, the, the meter here, you can see the photo resistor. Now that's four ohms, four and a half ohms. And as I move it, it's six ohms, seven, eight, nine, ten. 18 ohms, move it over here, it's about 25 ohms, move it over here, it's 30 ohms, move it over there, it's even more. And if I, if I point it away from the light, like over here, it's gone up to 79 ohms. Now, if I point it at my black shirt, it's 120 ohms. If I bring it closer to me, it's a 190, 200, if I press it right against my black shirt, it's about 5,000 ohms. And if I put it under my coat and press and push it down, it's a little less. Let me try putting it in my pocket of my black shirt and then doing up my coat. And now it's gone to about 6,000 ohms. 7,000, 8,000 ohms, it's settling a little. And you can see as I put less light into it, the resistance increases. So a conductance is one over resistance. So that's a, a good frame of reference. You could say that as the light shines on the photoresistor, its conductance increases. This is called a photoresistor or LDR light detecting resistor, or sometimes it's called a CDS, cadmium sulfide cell, uh, or electric eye. They go under many different names and they cost about 75 cents at Creatron. So what I, I, I do is a, a lot of us will, will buy one of these photo detectors and, and, uh, and a, a, a multimeter and use that as a way of testing and checking the, um, the electric, uh, the amount of light present in a scene. So the photocell experiment is an experiment in which we try to apply the thinking, the philosophy of photoquantographic sensing to this device. The 
photo resistor gives you some function f of the quantity of light. So let me shut off this, this light for a second. And instead, I'm going to turn the backlight on my table on just a little bit there. And I'll clear off a, a spot here. I'll put some of this instrumentation aside for a moment. So now what we have fundamentally is we have some, some quantity f of q of x, y that we're picking up. So we have some function f of the quantity q. And, and we call this quantigraphic unit. And so Q is this, this quantigraphic unit denoting the quantity of that which we're trying to sense. And we know that there's different interpretations of Q. There's different gain settings. So more, more generally, what we're going to measure is F of some constant K times Q of X comma Y, because a typical measuring instrument like this one here, this, this meter, or this one here, or any of these instruments that we have here. Any of these measuring devices will often have settings or gain settings on them. So we can adjust uh, how sensitive they are. So they can be, the gain can be lower or higher. And so we can take different readings. So for example, on this meter here, on this voltmeter, um, it can measure voltage or resistance. And, and so some of them are auto ranging and some of them are manual, but let's say we have a manual uh, voltmeter. We've got various voltages that you can, various voltage settings and you can measure. By the way, the most sensitive voltmeter ever made in human history, the most sensitive measurement instrument that was ever manufactured in human history. That is to say the best amplifier or measuring device that humankind has ever produced is this. I've got it here. I've got one of these. This is a PAR124A lock-in amplifier. I just want to show that because this is a good example of the best that humankind has ever achieved on measuring things. And I'll turn up my front light so you can see it. I'll turn down the back light. <laughs> so this is a PAR124A lock-in amplifier. It was manufactured in 1961 and it is still these are still widely used at Stanford University, at Los Alamos Labs, at MIT. When I first arrived at Stanford and went to the physics labs, of course, they had one of these doing for doing their experiments. And um, there's still somebody in Texas, uh, Sean, you know, uh, um, Mr. Tucker in Texas, you know, at, at his Tucker Instruments there, he calibrates these things for the whole, the whole world. Everybody sends them in to get them fixed and calibrated at this one shop. So this is the differential preamplifier here. And you can change these preamplifier units uh, depending on what, whether you want to measure differentially or what kinds of signals you want to measure. There it is, it kind of comes into focus for a second there. So this, you have different gain settings on here. And you can see if I set this, this gain, so there's a meter here that measures how much of something is present. And then, you know, you have your, your signal channel over here. You got your sensitivity. Over here, it's 500 millivolts, which is half a volt, 200 millivolts, 150 millivolts, 20, 10, 5, 2, 1, 
um, 500 microvolts, 200 microvolts, 100 microvolts down to, and you keep turning it down 50, 20, 10, 5, 2, 1 microvolt, and then you go to nanovolts, 50, 500 nanovolts, 200 nanovolts, 100 nanovolts. So this device will measure down to about 1 nanovolt, uh, and it's capable of ignoring noise sources that are about a, th a thousand, you know, or you know, no noise sources. It's got you know even up to about a million times as much noise it can ignore, and it it has a gain of about ten billion uh, if we go to a ten volt output on down to one nanovolt. So, what setting do we use here? Well, one thing is it depends kind of on the signal we're trying to measure. So. One question is, okay, we can set it here and measure, and then it'll give us a certain scale, set it here. A general rule of thumb with these meters, any meter uh, of the old variety, is whenever you're measuring something, this is a simple multimeter here. I can, this one is not very capable. It can only do 500 volts, 250 volts, 10 volts, or 500 microvolts. That's microamps even, so that's not much range. So if, let's say if I'm measuring something a signal that varies and it goes up and down in voltage. Well, I can set it to 500 volts, and then it'll, if the signal varies from you know zero to to 300 volts or something, the 500 volts is good for when it's strong. But when it's weaker, I I want to then set it to less. And so AGC or automatic gain control. Some cameras have automatic exposure. Some recording devices have automatic gain control, automatic level control, ELC, AGC, whatever you call them. Uh, they automatically adjust the level, and that is good to a certain point. But still, as you saw from the exposure of the camera, it doesn't matter what exposure you set. There's going to be some things that'll pick up better than others. And so my philosophy was to take measurement, take readings at all, at all or many different gain settings. So I would measure at 500, measure at 250, measure at 100 as a function of time. I would take three of these meters, let's say, of one set to 500 volts, another set to 250 volts and another set to 10 volts if these were recording onto some device and, and record all three of them and then mathematically analyze what's going on. So again, I have an array of measuring instruments or gain sensitivities. Imagine if you had each of these possible gain settings. And when you can adjust this electronically switch between the gains, that's what gives you, facilitates this notion of HDR sensing where you can automatically adjust different gains, different gain sensitivities. So what allows us to do that is the fact that, say, a camera can be uh, turned to a very high exposure or a very low exposure and uh, without damage to the, to the camera. So it can massively overexpose or underexpose something without damaging the camera. And that's what we call dynamic range. So the basic premise is that what we call dynamic range is much greater than usually dynamic range. That is to say, we can expose, massively overexpose something. So we have this, this, uh, this idea that the, the dynamic range is much greater than are, are, are much less than the dynamic range. So the range at which things will be damaged, uh, that is to say, what will damage the sensor? How much light can we shine into a camera before it'll be damaged? Uh, so if that margin is quite high, that is to say there's a, the image will all white out and be useless before the camera's damaged. So if I gain up my camera like this, At this point, if I gain up the camera, let's say I make it, you know, 8,000 ISO, 10,000, 128,000, what's the highest ISO I can get? Here is 200, 200, 250, ISO. Right now that camera is massively overexposed and you can, you can actually see in the darkest, deepest shadows under my desk there. This is the darkest part of the room under this desk. You can still see, uh, what's under that desk and it hasn't damaged the camera. You see everything's all white without actually doing damage to the camera. And if I go back to a reasonable ISO like 800 or something. Now of course you can't see anything under that under that desk there. So 
the idea is that there's a, a wide margin between what will damage the camera and what it can measure or sense. And, and what we can do is reclaim HDR allows us quantigraphic imaging, comparometric equations, and so on, allow us to do to, to do that kind of to have that margin. Historically, the world's first photograph, uh, interestingly, the world's first photograph was taken on uh, in 1826 on a on a, a dinner plate. People used to make these uh, camera obscura things, and they would. Uh, what it, it was noticed, it was observed that roofing materials like tar, you know, tar paper. This is kind of what you use on a roof. You know, if you're making a roof, you put down this stuff. You put down a roll like this of this uh, this material, which is impregnated with asphalt bitumen. Uh, and what is it? Has anybody been up on a roof lately? What is it that you notice when you're up on a roof? You know, if you got shingles, these are shingles, or these rolls of paper, or uh, fiberglass. This is a roll material. What do you notice about that material? You know, the first thing that I noticed about it is it's covered in stones. This is the edge where they join together, so that's not exposed. But all of this is stones. It looks like a beach. I used to always like to sit up on the roof because I thought it reminded me of being on a beach with all the pebbles or stones. And there's stones all over the roof. And the reason that rooftops have stones on them and they're covered with pebbles is because this stuff that roofs are made out of is easily damaged by light. So the pebbles are to keep the light from shining on this material that's easily damaged by exposure to light. So if you notice that rooftops that are on the sunny side, I noticed there's a there's a building next door to me and the roof was all deteriorated on the sun facing south side, but on the north side, it was almost in perfect condition. So sunlight is the enemy of bitumen or asphalt. Uh, so somebody had a brilliant idea and that was to coat a dinner plate, to coat a plate with bitumen of Judea, which is kind of what they were using for fixing roofs, rooftops, and to put that inside a camera obscura and leave that for a long time, like all day for eight hours or so, and at the end of the day to develop it in mineral spirits. And some areas of the bitumen were damaged by the light and uh, other areas were not. And this difference in solubility uh, allowed uh, some of the areas to be dissolved away by the mineral spirits, whereas other areas were not dissolved away. So it formed the world's first image, a recording of the photograph was by the damage done to roofing materials. So this suggests the idea, very fundamental concept of dynamic range. What uh, What is the definition and conceptualization of, of this sort of damage? And likewise, uh, we know TV cameras, old television cameras, like this is a TV camera. It has a Viticon tube in it. This is an older television camera. It has a vacuum tube based technology called a Viticon inside it and the lens on it uh, if you look at the lens on it, it has an f-stop. And what's really interesting to notice on this f-stop is that the f-stop has numbers on it, and one of them is C. So it goes like f2, 5, uh, 4, 8, 16. These are double stops because in between 2, then it's 2, 2.84, 5.6, and then eight and there's 11 in between, it's not marked. And then there's 16 and then 22. And then C means closed or infinity. And if you look in there, the iris, the leaves actually close completely. So what is it that makes that TV camera? Why did they have a C setting on the camera to close it out totally? And this was 
this idea, I'll switch back to my view here. So the C setting on the camera, and then I've got another one up there. There's a camera up there behind me. In fact, if I take the lens off of this camera, I'll unscrew the lens from this camera for a second so that you can see it, because this is really interesting to observe, is that this is a TV lens. And you'll notice again also, let me focus. This is manual focus, this camera here. At least I've got it set to manual. So that's your C setting. And so you look at that aperture, the iris, it goes from 1.4. So here's F1.4. And then F2, 2.8, 4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16. And then it goes, eventually it goes all the way to C. And if you look through that thing here, let's say, if I look through it, you can kind of see that, that the, the leaves of the, the shape of the iris there. I'll make it, I'll go down a little bit in exposure so you can see that. And then ISO, let's go up to ISO 100 and Let's go to say a 60th of a second or something. Now you can see through there, you can actually see through that, that lens there. And you can see as I open and close it, it goes completely closed. So here it is opening up. You can see the leaves. It's like a hexagonal pattern. There's six ir iris leaves there and they close down, 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 down. And it goes completely closed. So why would they make a camera that has an iris that goes all the way closed? So you notice that, that with TV lenses in particular, let me get back to a uh, reasonable shutter speed, like 15 and a reasonable ISO, like maybe 800. So why is it with TV lenses that they go completely closed. Well, the reason is because TV cameras are damaged by too much light, at least they were in the early days. And it wasn't until they developed, you know, CCD sensing arrays that they were able to, uh, to get CCD, charged coupled devices, uh, CCD cameras, for example, and CMOS cameras, uh, more modern, uh, that they were able to finally develop cameras that had a greater dynamic range and maybe less dynamic range, but more dynamic range. And what I noticed in the early 90s is I saw a trend, and that was that the dynamic range of cameras are increasing, but the dynamic range is decreasing. That is to say, there's a window of opportunity that was opening between the dynamic range and the dynamic range. And I saw that window as an opportunity, and I said, okay. I can kind of exploit that opportunity and capture more of the information. In other words, a camera, the cameras were becoming able to withstand more light without damage, but while at the same time their dynamic range was reducing. So the camera was able to be massively overexposed. So I, I, I noticed that I could take that picture and massively overexpose the image without damaging the camera and thus capture the deepest, darkest shadows and then in the next exposure, take less exposure and less and less and less until I got really short exposures. And also these new electronic cameras can take really short exposures as well. So they can get long exposures and short exposures. So what I noticed is that the dynamic range was increasing, the dynamic range was decreasing, and the ability to take exposures over a wide range was increasing because the control systems on these cameras allowed for really short shutter speeds, for example. So for TIG welding or arc welding, we could get like a one microsecond or less exposure and then get a one microsecond exposure, two microseconds, four microseconds, eight microseconds, 16 microseconds, 32 and so on, and just keep doubling the exposure and get a whole bunch of different exposures of a TIG welding process or an electric arc welder. And so we made all these camera systems for measuring uh, different uh, 
<clears throat> different quantities. And so these are all these uh, up here. I've got all these systems that we made that uh, allow us to measure camera. We made this housing to cool the camera so the electric arc welder went overheat it. And then we made this little cover with these clear glass lenses that could be cheaply and easily replaced when the sputter and sparks fly and put pits and so on in the lens. So we could throw that away and put a new one on there without damaging the camera lens and get it in really close to the welding process. And we're able to see a dynamic range of more than 100 million to one by simply, uh, um, by simply allowing us uh, to uh, to be able to to capture the, the the world around us. This is the Manvis system. I'll go, and that was a welding Camry that uses standard welding glass. You know the the welding glasses people used to wear were just these screw in things that you unscrew and change the filter. So we just use these because there's lots of these around for people wearing the welding glass. They just have a lot of those pieces of blank glass sitting around. We could put different filters in there if we wanted to look at the IR, or UV, HDR, IR, HDR, UV, HDR visible. So there's a whole bunch of things that we're going to learn about in this next lab. So your lab that's coming up, we're going to be looking at differently exposed pictures. So what I want you to do is I want each of you to go out and try and photograph something with differently exposed pictures. Take an overexposed, underexposed, normally exposed image and try to think about how we might use that difference in exposure to determine scientifically what's present in the scene. If you have a manual exposure camera, then you can set it manually like a Huawei P30 Pro uh, or many cameras have a Pro setting on it that allows manual exposure. Or if you don't, then you can download an app that allows manual exposure. You want to hold your camera steady and get these different exposures. So you want to to grab your camera and hold it steady. So you can, if you don't have a tripod, then you know you want to stabilize it against something. So let's say if I was trying to take some pictures of something, I would hold my camera steady against some object like this, hold it against a table, press it like this, or against some object like this. If you hold it here, tape it or hold it against an object like this and take pictures that differ only in exposure. Take some pictures of some stuff that's not moving, things that are not changing, and they differ only in exposure. So you want to do take, you know, like a one second, two second, four second and eight second exposure or shorter, whatever they are, but take different exposures of the same thing exactly. So I want everybody to try that and understand what the result is and see this kind of little homework assignment for tonight is go out and shoot some things and take a look and and let me know how you make out you know are you able to hold the camera steady against some object steady it against here take one exposure and then another exposure and another exposure if you can't get your phone just if you somehow can't get an app on your phone that does manual exposure or if you can't get manual exposure the other thing you can do is use the automatic exposure in the camera as it is and just take a picture like this and then hold a piece of white cardboard right in the middle of the picture to get it to gain up, gain down. When you hold a piece of white cardboard in the middle of the picture, it'll gain down its sensitivity and darken the image. And then hold a piece of black cardboard in the middle of the picture and take another picture, it'll gain up. And then cut out the center of the picture where the cardboard is and consider only the rest of the image. So that's kind of a quick, simple hack if you can't get manual exposure on your camera that will allow you to get differently exposed pictures of the same subject matter. So I want you to capture differently exposed pictures of the same subject matter and try and understand what these differences show you. What information is visible in, in an underexposed image? What information is visible in an overexposed image? And what information is visible in like a properly or normally exposed image? So that's, uh, that's it for today. And I'm gonna continue uh, recording this material and produce more of this material online that you'll be able to view. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Any questions, Joe?